Good day and welcome to JCC Sunday Schools in Session, where Sunday School matters to God. Please like and subscribe to our channel. We would love for you to be a part of our Sunday School family. Our Sunday School lesson today is titled Jesus Points to Jonah, and it's coming from Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 through 32, and then 38 through 40. Now, this week's lesson examines our incident from the life of Christ in which he was falsely accused by the Pharisees. He is used to bring about an accusation that he is doing work from the devil. And it's all because people don't believe in him. Christ goes in and gives a sign about the sign that they need to see will be the same sign of Jonah, that after three days, he will be raised up again to bring about salvation. So let's get into the lesson and see what it has to offer us this week. Verses 22 and 23 read, then was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? Now, there are a few things that we can our attention from the lesson today. The first three things are typical of Jesus' healing work, that the man is instantly healed and is complete, that it isn't a part job. When Christ heals it is a complete work. The next is the people were amazed at what they saw, that they saw a man whom they knew was demon-possessed, and he had a deaf and mute a spirit, that they saw it and were amazed. And as a result of this, they honored Jesus by calling him the son of David. And also from this here, we can see that here and throughout the Bible, that demons can, not always, but they can cause physical problems physical limitations, and physical sicknesses in a human body. So this demon causes man to be blind and deaf. The text doesn't say how Christ healed him, but we know he did do it. So we give God the glory for Christ's authority over the enemy. Now, let's get into our questions. Question one says, why was the healing of the demon-possessed man a particularly impressive demonstration of Jesus' power? Healing a demon-possessed man was undeniably a miracle. In order to release uh, the demon from this man, it required divine intervention from God. Everyone knew that a demon possession was a potent force. And again, it required divine intervention. It, it required someone of a heavenly nature because this could not just merely be done by man's ability. Question two says, why did the people ask whether Jesus was the son of David? People were witnessing this great miracle and it suggested that Jesus might be the son of David, meaning they viewed what he did as a messianic act. Even the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 35, 5 through 6, it was prophesied that the Messiah would perform miraculous healings. And so this healing Christ had accomplished here, it prompted these people to wonder whether he might be the Messiah. They begin to wonder and ask one another, is not this the son of David? Again, they knew only the power of God could break the power of the devil. So they recognized, gave the emphasis that Christ was the Messiah. The next set of verses deal whose authority Christ is working under. Let's read them and, and see. Verses 24 through 32 read, But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doeth not cast out devils, but by Bezalel, the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall, be, shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Bezalel cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto man, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto man. And whosoever speak of the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven them. But whosoever speak against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, 
neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now, question three says, how did the Pharisees explain away the miracle? Now, they flatly refused to consider that the idea that Christ was the Messiah. Even though they saw him exercise power over this demon, they refused to go in and equate him to the Messiah, to having this divine uh, influence from the Holy Ghost working in him. They concluded that Jesus had worked by the power of Bezebul, which is another name for Satan, who is the prince of the demon. So the Pharisees were accusing Christ of being a sorcerer, which was a serious charge because sorcery back then was punishable under death by the Jewish law. Let's read it in Deuteronomy uh, 18, verses 9 through 12. And I'll be using the Message Bible just to let it make a little bit more a clearer sense. It reads, when you enter the land that God, your God, is giving you, don't take on the abominable ways of life of the nations there. Don't you dare sacrifice your sons or your daughters in the fire. Don't practice divination, sorcery, fortune telling, witchery, casting spells, holding seances, channeling with the dead. People do these things are an abomination to God. It's because of just such abominable practice that God, your God, is driving these nations out before you. Again, they were trying to connect divine work of God with the abominable practice of the enemy. They were trying to make Christ good and make it out for evil, trying to go and sway people to think that it was not of God. So rather than recognize Jesus' deity and his miracle, the Pharisees misinterpreted what he did to fit their own preconceptions. Some people will say anything to sway us from believing in Christ. So they had already decided that they will reject Christ in the past. What he had done here was no different. They didn't want to give him any credit, any uh, accolade to make the people want to follow him more. So the Messiah here, they accused him of working with Satan. Although the Pharisees did not directly speak to Jesus, he was aware of what they were thinking. Christ was able to perceive their thoughts just like he's able to perceive our thoughts even to this day. We cannot hide from God. He sees all and knows all. So even on the level of human insight, it was obvious that the Pharisees were seeking to disrupt the people's confidence in Christ. They didn't want the people to believe in Christ. So they set up this here way to say he was doing it in the uh, in the power of the devil to try to stop people from believing in him. Question four says, how did Jesus use logical reason to prove that the Pharisees were incorrect? Christ pointed out that every house must be unified or it falls apart. A kingdom that is divided by civil war will eventually come to ruin. A house torn by division cannot stand. This is common sense here. If we look at it from a spiritual perspective or our lives today, God requires unity within the body of believers. We're called to unify, be on one accord. This is how the body of believers are successful in accomplishing God's work. When we come together and operate on one accord, we can do great and mighty things for God. To God be the glory. Question five is why did Jesus mention the exorcism performed by some of the Pharisees following? Christ asked the Pharisees at this point, those who you agree with, who power do they exercise demons? If they casted out demons by the power of God, then they should say Christ was not by Satan, but also by the power of God. Satan is not in the business of casting demons out of people to make them free. Only that of Jesus Christ is willing to do that uh, aspect. Question six is why did Jesus incite that the kingdom of of God had come to them. If the Messiah was here casting out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God was upon them. It was right there at hand. Christ is saying, you shouldn't oppose God's rule and not reject me. You should be accepting me. The kingdom of God is at hand. You should accept my rule over your life. So what is Jesus saying here? He's saying quite plainly that if he is casting out demons by the Spirit of God, they should understand a very clear sign of the kingdom of God has come. That Jesus has come to set the captives free. From whom? The enemy, Satan. When did Christ bound this here strong man? 
If we go back to Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11, we won't read them today, but Christ defeated Satan in the wilderness. Immediately afterwards, we see the demons crying out for mercy or permission or being silenced and cast out by Christ because Christ, when he defeated the enemy, defeated the strong man in the wilderness, he gained all right power and authority over the enemy. And from that point on, the enemy, every time they encountered Christ, had to subject themselves to his will, to his power, to his authority. And whatever he said done was done. No demon was able to contend with them. So the kingdom of heaven is indeed upon them. And the Pharisees, again, are blinded and they are blaspheming the Holy Spirit out of hate for our Savior. Christ then draw a line in the sand and say, whoever is for me is for me, but whoever is against me is against me. There's no neutral ground. Either we are with Christ or we are against him. Question says, why was there no neutral ground when it came to believing Jesus? Christ's miracles demanded that people make a decision about him. Those who said what he did and accepted him as the Messiah were with him. Those who observed Jesus' miracle and refused to acknowledge that he was indeed the Son of God were against him. So how people responded to Jesus placed them either on God's side or against his cause. So the same holds true today. How we respond determines our willingness to surrender or not to God's word, his authority, and his plans for our life. If we respond in the right way, we are subjected underneath his authority. If we don't respond, then we're saying we're better off without him. We can do it our way. We are required to respond in the right way for God and the things of God. And as we do that, we receive the benefits and the blessings that comes with it. Question 8 says, why did Jesus say that the Pharisees had committed an unforgivable sin? This here unforgivable sin was a clear demonstration that they rejected the power of the Holy Spirit that worked in Jesus Christ. They equated it to the work of Satan, which then made it unforgivable rejection of truth. They didn't want to see it was the power of God working through Jesus. That there became an unforgivable sin. So Jesus rebuked the Pharisees and warned them that their current sin can forever separate them from God's forgiveness. Rejecting the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters, is blaspheming him. And this extends to declaring that his works that he uh, does are done in the power of Bezabel. The Pharisees didn't realize their hearts were hardened and they were about to lose their only means for salvation. So Christ shows them there is no middle ground. He silenced the Pharisees and gave them a grave warning for their sins in verse 32. The kingdom of heaven was upon them, yet they continued to plot against Christ the son of the living God. Verses 38 through 40 read, Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh out the sign, and there shall no sign be given it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So we see here again in, in, in this year, they want a sign, but he called them an adulterous generation that seeks the sign. Because if we truly have faith in God, we don't need a sign. We don't need a sign if we truly put our faith and trust in God. Only those who do not truly believe God want to see a sign from God. So Jesus said, I will give you a sign, but it ain't going to be the sign that you want. It's going to be a sign to show you just as God miraculously brought Jonah from the belly of a whale after three days, I will rise from the grave after three days as well. Question 9 says, why did the scribes and Pharisees ask Jesus for a sign? They didn't want to admit their error. They didn't want to repent. They demanded a sign to prove that he was the Messiah. They were basically saying that they did not believe that he was the Messiah. He had not demonstrated to them clearly enough that he was the Messiah. So people of faith, again, don't need a sign. They believe God at his word. The sins of the Pharisees that blasphemy was causing them to have a spiritual blindness. And this spiritual blindness was causing them to get further from God versus getting closer. 
they were getting to a place where they had a self-imposed blindness about the spiritual matters of God. Question 10 says, what was the only sign that they would be given? They saw the sign, but again, Jesus said that the only sign for them to get was the sign of Jonah. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days, that Jesus Christ would go into the earth for that same length of time and rise up as well. And this was a cryptic way of Jesus foretelling his death and resurrection. For the early Christians, the resurrection was God's undeniable sign that Jesus indeed was the Son of God. So for the Pharisees, however, even this sign was insufficient to move them from their unbelief. The evidence was clear that it had to be accepted. The Pharisees, though, were unwilling to do that. They were unwilling to accept what Jesus would do in order to redeem mankind. So this is shows a sign of not being committed to him. They refused to be committed to Christ and his work and the cause that he came to this earth. So the point is that as Jonah was swallowed up by the great fish, so would Christ be also swallowed up by the earth. Christ rose to bring salvation, just like Jonah. He was an instrument to bring about salvation. Jonah went in and preached and delivered a message of salvation to the Ninevites. Christ delivers a message of salvation to the world. That we, just like the Ninevites, were a a Gentile nation, uh, those who were not chosen into the family, He allowed them to have redemption, allowed them to have salvation to come into the family. And the entirety of the world now has the same right if they choose and accept the way that Jesus Christ said, accept his message. Just like the Ninevites accept Jonah's message, if we accept the message of Jesus Christ, we too will receive salvation. So in conclusion to this lesson, we can take away from this that even as a child of God, we too will face opposition, even when we're doing right. People will call you everything but a child of God, but don't let that stop you. Keep the faith. Keep on believing. Let the Lord fight your battle. We are called to stay on the side of right and not stoop on the side of wrong. So we see this here, that the message of salvation needs to go out. Even though people may ridicule you, may bring you down, we still need to preach, teach, evangelize the lost. We still need to let people know that Jesus Christ still lives. And we must be careful when people come in and explain to them when they try to go in and blaspheme the Holy Ghost because a heart that is blaspheming the Holy Ghost is so corrupt that it cannot come back. So we want to go in and begin to preach a word or teach a word to help them to see that Christ is the means of salvation. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this lesson this week. If you enjoyed this lesson, please leave us a comment and subscribe to our channel. We have so many things we're doing uh, during the week. If you'd like to be a part of our Bible study on Monday night, our small talk session with Kenya and Dawn, maybe you want to be a part of a man talk or a woman talk where we talk about issues dealing with those genders. This happens on Thursday nights. Just visit us on our webpage and see all the details so that you too can be a part of everything that we have going on. Well, that's all for this. We come back next week, same time, same channel. Be blessed now.